the beginning of the end. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 8. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Jesus was asked by his disciples what would be the signs of the end. The response of Jesus gives us the insight to what will begin to happen at the beginning of the end. Brethren, this world will not last forever. Things are winding up already, and we are at the beginning of the end. Jesus gave us the signs that will mark the beginning of the end, and we are already seeing their manifestations in our day. The first sign that marks the beginning of the end, as Jesus said, is the high level of deception that will be in operation in the end time. More than any other time in history, the level of deception has skyrocketed. Many people have fallen victim of false prophets and teachers, teachers who are more interested in getting bums on seats than people. This is an age of deception, and you need to be warned about this. And you need to be alert. When you watch the news, you must be discerning. When you listen to a sermon, you must be discerning. We live in an age that attempts to exalt individuals, to raise them up, to become their own God. That is a deception. You cannot be your own God. We live in an age of the prosperity gospel, where pastors and motivational speakers attempt to get you to feed that gospel with the prosperity gospel. That is a deception. Jesus did not come and die so that you can live your best life here on earth. He came and died so that you may have eternal life. He died so that throughout all the endless ages, you will be with him for eternity. That's why he came, so that you may not perish. He did not come and die so that you may earn six figures a year and drive fancy sports cars. There is nothing wrong with having money or driving a fancy car. But it is deceptive for preachers and teachers to attempt to deceive you with the prosperity gospel. Having stuff, having money, does not equate to having a right relationship with God. There are people who are richer than you and me, but they have a one-way ticket to hell. Do not be deceived by the prosperity gospel. The ministry of false prophets has greatly prospered because we are approaching the end of time. Deception has eaten deep into our society to the point it has increasingly become difficult to trust anyone. Only those who have given themselves to a consistent and personal fellowship with the Holy Spirit can survive this season. Know your Bible and be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you will never be deceived. Another sign of the beginning of the end, which Jesus gave to us, is wars and rumors of wars. We don't need an explanation or many examples to know the current state of the world. Nations with nuclear energy are developing their nuclear weapons. Virtually every nation is in preparation for an untold battle. While wars are ongoing between different countries, we keep hearing rumors of future wars that would only leave people in great fear of the unknown. 
Jesus added that nations shall rise against nations, and kingdoms shall rise against kingdoms. Violence and civil unrest are all signs of the end. When you hear that two nations have risen against themselves, or when you read in the news that different nations are preparing their ammunitions for war, know that the prophecies of Christ about the beginning of sorrows are being fulfilled. All these signs are evident in our day. But as believers, we are not to be troubled because we are assured that the Lord Jesus will come back for us. John chapter 14 verses 1 through 7 Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Look at the words of Jesus. I will come again and receive you unto myself. Don't fear the beginning of sorrows, for you know that Jesus is coming again for you. Look forward to heaven. Look forward to heaven. Additionally, at the beginning of the end, natural disasters will increase. There will be famine, pestilence, and earthquakes at the end of the world. Across the world, there is a current geographic issue bordering around global warming and climate change. This is greatly affecting the yield and supply of food around the world. The yield of food is reducing while the world's population is on the rise. Right now, famine is hitting some nations of the world. In terms of pestilence, outbreaks of disease are signs of the beginning of the end. New and deadly diseases are being discovered. Viral infections that could claim the lives of hundreds of thousands of people are giving us the end-time signals. We can attempt to find scientific and logical explanations to some of these events, but the truth remains that pestilence is a sign of the end time. It should remind us that the beginning of the end is here. Earthquake is another natural disaster that will increase and be a mark at the commencement of the end time. Jesus said that these natural disasters will take place in diverse regions of the world, and so they are happening in our day. The most touching word that Jesus spoke after revealing all these is that they are only the beginning of sorrows. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5 through five, also tells us about the signs that will precede the end. It says, this know also, that in the last days perilous time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce-breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. All these signs mentioned in this passage will point us to the end of the world. When you begin to observe these signs, then you need no prophet to tell you that we are in the beginning of the end. This is that perilous time Paul wrote about. P. 
people are becoming more sinful than ever. Unfortunately, they are unrepentant too. Worse still are those who claim to be churchgoers, but only have the form of godliness. When we begin to see people who claim to be Christians exhibiting these signs, then we can be sure that the beginning of the end has closed in on us. This is the time for us to uphold our faith and endure while patiently waiting for the rapture of the saints. No matter how dark the world gets, let your light shine. As Christians, let us love one another. Let us love one another. Let us shine bright and look after the hopeless and helpless. Let us look after orphans, widows, and the oppressed. We, as the children of God, are to shine bright. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, You are the light of the world. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, At one time you were darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. So both of them say, Christians are light. Not only that, they both agree that the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. The shining of your light as a Christian is bearing practical fruit in good deeds, what is good and right and true. The reason Jesus said that all these signs are the beginning of sorrow is because the affliction of the Great Tribulation will be worse than them all. The Great Tribulation will be great indeed, and only those who make the rapture will escape it. This is the beginning of the end. We can prepare and make our ways right before the trumpet sounds. How will the world explain the rapture? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 53 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The Bible uses the term, quote, mystery, to refer to a sacred secret. It is something that has been hidden in the past, but was eventually revealed. Paul is telling us that not all will sleep, and sleep in this sense is referring to die. So what Paul is saying is that there will be a generation of saints who will not experience death, but they will be changed or glorified at the time of Christ's coming for his bride, the church. Jesus is called our blessed hope, whose glorious appearing we watch for in the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. His glorious appearing is most commonly called the rapture, and it will be the time when Christians in the grave will be bodily raised, and those still alive will be caught up to heaven to be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16-17 through 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. How will the world explain the rapture? Are they preparing us? When the rapture does happen, the world governments and systems will need to explain what has happened. I think we can all conclude that they will not turn to Christian eschatology in order to explain the rapture of the saints. It is a pretty safe assumption that the world systems and governments won't turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
verses 16 through 17, or 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53, to explain the event of the rapture. Theory number one, aliens. There is also a growing number of people that hold the belief that UFOs, or unidentified flying objects, are real. There are certain groups of people who believe that UFOs and aliens are real and that they have been visiting our planet Earth throughout our history. In fact, some believe that aliens are even here today and that they're vastly more advanced than us. There are a number of things that people have seen and assumed them to be aliens or UFOs, such as satellites, planes, and sky lanterns. However, people who argue in support of aliens and UFOs' existence point out some unusual characteristics displayed by what they called UFOs that don't fit with any known terrestrial technology or phenomena that others have claimed to be aliens. Some of those unusual characteristics they pointed out have been extreme speeds and possible changes of direction that defy the law of physics. That is, speeding in one direction and then suddenly changing to another at a sharp angle without any slowing down and also blinking in and out as though a fluctuating light switching on and off. The rise in the belief and interest in UFOs and UAPs can be linked to governments across the world acknowledging sightings of UAPs. The Bible suggests to us that during the same time period as the rapture, there will be a powerful deception that keeps most people from believing in Jesus, despite the impact of millions of people disappearing during the rapture. Matthew chapter 24 verse 24 states, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The Bible, however, does not define what this deception will be. It is not far-fetched to believe that with the rise in interest and acknowledgement in aliens, UFOs, and UAPs, it is not unthinkable that one of perhaps many views will be that aliens were responsible for the disappearance of many humans. Could they be creating a built-in excuse for the rapture? Are they preparing the world this way? Theory number two, are they preparing the world through Hollywood movies? Films with the plot centered around a significant chunk of the human race strangely disappearing. Two of the top 10 highest grossing movies of all time at the worldwide box office include a plot centered around 50% of the population disappearing. Avengers Infinity War, which is the fifth highest grossing movie of all time, and Avengers Endgame, which is the second highest grossing movie of all time. Another film with a similar plot is Left Behind, released in 2014, where a small group of survivors are left behind after millions of people suddenly vanish and the world is plunged into chaos and destruction. Or the film This Is The End, released in 2013, where rapture events all took place. Could it be that these movies and countless of novels are being introduced so that when the rapture does happen, it will not be so alien to the world? The Bible is silent on what exactly the world will say in order to explain the events of the rapture. Some speculate that the world will try to use aliens as the explanation for the millions who have been raptured. They argue that this is the reason why there has been such an increase in extraterrestrial sightings. Some speculate that the world will attempt to explain the rapture by stating that those who have been raptured are in another dimension, another realm. This is all speculation. The truth is, we don't know what explanation the world will give. And in all honesty, you don't want to be left behind to hear what excuse the world will use to explain the rapture anyway. There is something you need to know about the God of this world. The God of this world is an expert at explaining things away. The God who is the devil has explained his way out of so many things. For instance, the devil has explained himself away. We live in a generation of people that claim to believe in God, but at the same time, don't believe there is a devil. The Bible describes Satan as the God of this world, but society does not acknowledge his existence. But if you look at the world, 
and the direction of the world, you can see the work of the God of this world. The God of this world is hostile towards Christians and ministers. You see a path to where Christian ministers will no longer be able to preach the gospel because to spare people's feelings and sinful lifestyles. I do believe we are heading towards a place where Christian ministers will be put into prison for preaching the truth of the gospel. And it will all be because of the God of this world who does a fantastic job of explaining himself away. But that is one of the strongest attributes of Satan, explaining using the means of deception. And no doubt when the rapture happens, the God of this world will have some elaborate explanation that will deceive the world. However, I am sure that when the rapture happens, there will be those who are left behind who will be able to put two and two together and see that only born again believers have disappeared. The truth is, we don't know whether or not Hollywood films are preparing the world to face the reality of the rapture. Furthermore, we don't know how the world systems and the government will explain the disappearance of the children of God on earth. But what we do know, what we do know without a shadow of a doubt is that the rapture will happen. Are you living in Christ? That is what matters. Yes, we can speculate that this will happen or that will happen, but what truly matters, what truly matters is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Is he the Lord of your life? Is he the one you have placed all your trust into? Is he the one in whom you have believed in? Is he the love of your life? The one you yearn to see one day? Is he the very heartbeat of your life? That's what matters. Not what the world systems will say or what Hollywood movies are attempting to do to the world. What matters is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 24 verse 38 through 41 reads, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. The Rapture The Rapture is a biblical doctrine that refers to the moment when Jesus Christ will come back to take his faithful followers to be with him in heaven. This event is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The word rapture is not used in these two verses. However, that is the literal meaning of the phrase, quote, caught up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. The Latin translation of this verse used the word rupturo. The Greek word it translates is harpazo, which means to snatch or take away. Thus, there can be no doubt that the word used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 to indicate the actual removal of people from earth to heaven. When Jesus comes, he will come personally. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. For the Lord himself, and not death? For the Lord himself, and not an angel? For the Lord himself, he did promise, he did promise he would come again, did he not? John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. In verse 3, we see one of the most wonderful promises to the body of Christ. 
I will come again. I will come again. What a promise. There are two groups, those who are dead in Christ and those who are living in Christ. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. The saints that are asleep in Jesus will rise first. This is not talking about the wicked dead. This verse is talking about the righteous dead, godly people that died in the Lord, saints that lived a hundred years ago, saints that lived 200 years ago, saints that lived 300 years ago, saints that lived a thousand years ago. All of the saints that are asleep in Christ Jesus will be raptured, taken, caught up, and right side by side to those saints who are asleep in Jesus, we have those who are alive. In 1 Thessalonians, we have those who are asleep, and right side by side with those who are asleep, you also have we which are alive and remain. In the same passage of Scripture, you have living saints and you have dead saints. There is a generation of believers who live in a specific time that only God alone knows, who will not taste death, but rather they will be taken by the Lord Himself. Let's talk about those who are living in Christ. You are a part of those who are alive. And all across the world, there are people who are true believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we tend to live in our own local community and we go to the same church every week, we tend not to comprehend how truly big the body of Christ is in this world. God is a lot bigger than your church and your congregation. People were worshiping God long before your church was formed. Right across America, you will find men and women from all sorts of different backgrounds who are true worshipers of the one true God. The body of Christ is huge. Heaven will not just be populated with you and your church congregation. All across the world, there are true worshipers of the one true God. If you travel to different countries in Africa, there are so many people who are true born-again believers in Christ. In Europe, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and all across the world, there are people who worship Christ and adore Him. The rapture is not going to be a small event where one church goes missing. No, there will be a mass exodus. When the rapture takes place, it will not be a secret. Literally millions and millions of people will be taken by the Lord Jesus Himself. Don't fall into this self-righteous mistake that only people who believe exactly what I believe in will go to heaven. Don't fall into this trap that only people who agree with me 100% of the time are going to heaven. Don't fall into this trap that only people who attend my church will go to heaven. In heaven, there will be saints and God who don't agree with every single one of your theological standing points. Don't fall into the illusions that only people who look like you will be saved. No. Christ died for all mankind. Christ died for all. And right now, across the world, there are millions of Christians, millions and millions of true born-again Christians who believe wholeheartedly in the message of the cross, and they are being saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross has power and still has power. There are millions of Christians all across the world. In the heart of New York City, there are believers walking with the Lord just like Enoch walked with God. Across the various states in this nation, there are believers. Right now, somewhere, a believer in the Lord is making her way to work, praying in her heart to her Redeemer and Messiah. Right now, Somewhere there is a saint in God in the passenger seat of a car with his eyes closed, waiting and looking forward to the rapture. In the mountains of Nepal, there are true believers. In the heart of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, there are saints in God. In Lagos, Nigeria, there are saints in God. In London, England, Havana, Cuba, Paris, France, New Delhi, India, Kingston, Jamaica, all across the world, there are saints in God who believe in Christ. And if the rapture was to happen this very moment, all of them would be taken by their Redeemer and Messiah. And when the rapture takes place, 
It will change the world like nothing the world has ever seen before. It will be interesting how the world systems will attempt to explain the mysterious and strange disappearance of people all across the world, who all, who all have one thing in common. They are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no secret rapture. Once saints are taken, there will be a visible, clear departure from the earth. To recap the event of the rapture, those who have died in Christ will be resurrected from their graves and be reunited with their glorified bodies. After that, those who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Glorious body, the mortal will put on immortality. The corruptible shall put on incorruption, where death will be swallowed up in victory. God will give the believers caught up new bodies. Thank God there will be no more sickness. Aren't you tired of sickness? Aren't you tired of how frail this human body is? The glorious new body will not age or deteriorate. It will be a youthful body. Not only that, but this verse reveals to us the speed in which the rapture will happen. It will take place suddenly and quickly with believers who were faithful to the teachings of Christ being transformed in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. We shall be transformed into glorious beings, and this will happen so fast after the sounding of the last trumpet. We will meet up with Jesus in heavenly bodies. The event of the rapture will happen so fast that it will be over before the world knows what has happened. Before the world even has the slightest inclination what has happened, it will be over. There will be no time for goodbyes. There will be no time for last minute prayers. It will happen in an instant. During this time, God will release his wrath on the people that failed to follow the teachings of Christ. There is a time coming on this earth that this world is not prepared for. There is a time coming in the Bible called the Great Tribulation, but the vast majority of the people on this world are not concerned about this. During this time, evil will spread without restraint. During this period, we see in the book of Revelation, the wrath of God will be revealed. Those who live in disobedience, immorality, idolatry, corruption, slander, and other forms of sin will be left behind to face the wrath of the Lord. As Christians, it is important that we live our lives in anticipation of the rapture. We should be vigilant, watching and waiting for the return of our Lord and live in a way that is pleasing to him. We should strive to be ready for the rapture at all times. Luke chapter 12, verse 40. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Five ways to prepare for the second coming of Christ. Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36 says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfighting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. The return of the Lord is not supposed to catch the believers unaware. Christ has already given us all the indications of his return, and he has also told us all the measures we need to put in place to ensure that we are fully prepared for his coming. It is the desire of Christ that we all reign with him in eternity. However, the day of his coming is unknown to anyone. Not even Christ himself or the angels in heaven know the day of his return. The uncertainty of the very day of Christ's return is the reason we must all live our lives in a way that will qualify us to reign with him when he shall suddenly appear. Matthew 24 verse 36 says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, 
but my Father only. Christ warns us not to be overly conscious of the cares and pleasures of life so that his coming will not meet us unprepared. Therefore, believers are to live every day of their lives as if Christ will return the following hour. There are many who are beginning to lose the hope of the coming of Christ because of its delay. Throwing cautions to the wind is quite dangerous at this time because all the indicators of the imminence of Christ's return are being manifested in our very eyes. The pleasures of this world has entangled several believers and robbed them of their spiritual sight. We must always be on guard because Christ will come as a thief in the night who gives no notice to his victims. Matthew 24, 27 says, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It's clear to see to everyone who a believer is, to anyone who has read the Bible, that the second coming of Christ is at hand. The terrifying occurrences around the world make it clear that we are living in the end times. It was prophesied in the Bible, and now it's all coming to pass. It is not a question of if he will return, but when. And the only answer anyone could possibly give is, he is coming soon. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only, as it says in Matthew 24, 36. We are given a description of the signs we must look out for to know that the end is coming. Matthew 24, verses 11 through 14 says, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Practically, looking into the world nowadays, most of these warning signs are already manifesting. We now have false prophets all around us saying words of their own while living lives that are totally different from what Christ-likeness is. We encounter them on a daily basis, and we watch them twist the word of God to suit their selfish interest and to deceive people. Another sign that validates the fact that we are in the end time is the coldness of the church. You will notice that the unusual coldness of the church these days is alarming. Believers are no longer interested in hearing the truth of God's word. The sudden decline in the passion for God's work and walk with God tells us that the end is here. Gone are the days where believers tarry in God's presence to develop close intimacy with him. Everyone is now looking for a fast route to the kingdom of God. Some set of believers even see the second coming of Christ as an archaic doctrine that's no longer relevant in this time. But my dear, I tell you the truth, Christ is coming again. The scripture says it clearly in Matthew 24, 30, where it says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It is no lie that Christ is coming again. Now the question is, are you ready for the second coming of Christ? This is a big question you need to ask yourself because making heaven is our ultimate goal as believers. And it's never too late to prepare for the second coming of Christ. Now is the perfect time to start if you have not started preparing for him. Will you be ready when the time comes? Ways to prepare for the second coming of Christ. Starting with number one, we must be discerning. Philippians 1 verses 9 through 10 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. To prevent being caught unawares in this journey, you need to be highly discerning. There is a need to take note of times and seasons in correlation with God's word. The Bible is open to us as believers. Therefore, do not hesitate to study it appropriately to know the signs to look out for, lest the arrival of Christ catch you unaware. 
we need to pray for the ability to discern spirits so that we many may not be deceived by false teachings. 1 John 4 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Number two, we must not lose hope. Romans 8 verses 24 through 25 says, For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Another vital way to prepare for the coming of the Lord is to be vibrant in hope. Let us keep hoping for his coming and that our hearts and minds will be kept conscious that we are not of this world. The Bible says in Philippians 3.20, But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth is, no matter how long Jesus tarries, at the appointed time he will show up. Therefore, let us keep our hopes high in him. We can do this by continuing to read the word so that we may be strengthened. Because without hope, it's easier to fall into temptation and sin. Hebrews 9.28 says, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Number three, live each day as though it's the day of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 through 2 says, Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Living each day as though it's the last day will enable us to keep ourselves in proper check, so we will be ever ready this way, rather than thinking that the coming of Christ is some 20 decades to come, therefore leading to lack of focus. Number four, encourage one another. Hebrews 10 verses 24 through 25 says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Obviously, the role of encouraging one another as believers cannot be overruled, because we need each other's flame to be on fire for God. The nature of these times truly breathes coldness, but with the corporate power of unity, we shall overcome. There is so much more the body of Christ can achieve, even in this end time, if only we will learn to exhort one another as we await the day of the Lord. And finally, number five, keep doing the work Jesus has commanded us to do. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is the great commission that Christ has committed into our hands as his disciples, teaching all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. As we do this, we set our hearts to the coming of him who has sent us. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I therefore beseech you, fellow believer, that you get set for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ that is fast approaching, even as you lay aside every weight that may disqualify you. I pray the Lord Jesus counts us worthy to meet him. Matthew 24 verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This message carries a sobering tone because the topic of the rapture is indeed sobering. It is a thought 
that not everyone who attends church on Sunday will be raptured, and this realization can be quite solemn. Considering the vast number of churches around the world, each congregation will have a varying number of people taken on the day of the rapture. For instance, one church with 10,000 members may see only three members being raptured, while another church of the same size might witness 9,000 members being raptured. Some churches may have only 10% of their congregation raptured, while others may experience 100% of their congregation being taken. It is a thought that evokes a sense of sobriety and reflection. In some churches, mentioning the topic of the rapture is frowned upon, and believers may feel ashamed or hesitant to discuss it. However, it is important not to be ashamed of the rapture, even if those around you do not believe it will happen. Similar to how the world viewed Noah as crazy when he preached about the flood, believers should not let societal opinions discourage them from acknowledging the reality of the rapture. Reflecting on the days of Noah, we recall that only eight people were saved out of the millions that populated the earth at that time. The ark provided salvation to less than 0.001% of the world's population. Considering this, it raises the question of how many people will be saved when the rapture occurs. It is indeed a sobering thought. Will 10% of the world's population be raptured? Will 20% of the world's population be raptured? Only the Lord knows. It is crucial to understand that there is no collective salvation or salvation based on marital relationships. Each individual needs to cultivate their own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This realization further adds to the gravity and solemnity of the topic at hand. God's love for you is undeniable. It is something you know deep within your heart. However, we live in a generation where many deny the gospel. There are those who claim to be Christians but deny the need for repentance. Some question the authority of the Bible, while others doubt the occurrence of the rapture. Unfortunately, even some modern-day Christians deny the existence of hell. Yet, it is important to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke about hell. He warned that if something causes you to sin, it is better to remove it, even if it means entering life with one eye, than to be cast in the fires of hell. He was using hyperbole here. However, he was being direct about hell and the seriousness of it. Hell is a real place, despite the accusations that mentioning it is an attempt to instill fear. No one spoke about hell as explicitly as the Lord Jesus Christ did in the Bible. However, those who are raptured will be spared from experiencing hell. I have often wondered how the world will explain the rapture and its aftermath. The rapture will be a monumental event, unlike anything the world has ever witnessed. The sudden disappearance of hundreds of thousands of people in the blink of an eye will leave the world in a state of confusion. Once the rapture occurs, every believer will be caught up to meet the Lord in the skies, while unbelievers will be left behind to grapple with the aftermath of this astonishing event. After the rapture takes place, the world left behind will experience a church service like no other. It will be a gathering of people who are utterly surprised and shocked that they have been left behind. The pews will be filled with individuals who had family members or friends who were believers and warned them about the impending rapture. The ramifications of this event will be immense and will reshape history in profound ways. Imagine the scene as these individuals gather together, desperately seeking answers and trying to make sense of what has just transpired. They will be faced with the undeniable reality of the rapture and the fact that they have been left behind. The emotions in that church service will range from confusion and fear to grief and regret. Many will feel a deep sense of loss as they realize the truth of their loved one's warnings and the missed opportunity to be part of the raptured saints. This church service will be a pivotal moment in the lives of those left behind. It will be a time of reflection, soul searching, and grappling with the implications of their unbelief. They will witness firsthand the consequences of rejecting the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. The realization that they had dismissed 
or disregarded the warnings of their believing family members and friends will weigh heavily upon them. The world left behind will be thrust into a period of great turmoil and confusion as it tries to come to terms with the rapture and its aftermath. Only the Lord knows what will ensue as people grapple with the unexplained events and the massive void left by the departed believers. The church service after the rapture will serve as a powerful wake-up call for those who remain. It will force them to confront the reality of their choices and the truth of God's Word. Some may turn to faith in Christ, seeking redemption and salvation in the midst of chaos. Others, however, may respond with anger, defiance, or a hardened heart, refusing to acknowledge the truth and instead seeking to find alternative explanations or comfort in their own understanding. In the aftermath of the rapture, the world will be forever changed. The church service that follows will mark a pivotal moment in human history, a moment when the ramifications of unbelief and rejection of God's grace become undeniable. It will be a time of reckoning, a time for individuals to grapple with their choices and seek truth in the midst of unprecedented events. The Christians who will not be caught in the rapture are those who are Christians in name only. These individuals may profess to follow Christ, but they have not truly believed in His name. They attend church, but have never experienced genuine spiritual rebirth. Their minds may be filled with knowledge, but their hearts are far from God. It would be devastating for them to realize that the rapture has occurred and they have not been taken up while the events described in the book of Revelations are about to unfold. It is entirely possible for someone to possess extensive knowledge about the Word of God, but lack a genuine relationship with Him. The issue lies in these Christians being friends with the world. Consequently, their spiritual life becomes a mere facade. Instead, we should strive to fight the good fight of faith and live a Christian life that is consistent and wholehearted. Let us not settle for surface-level Christianity where we only identify as Christians when it is convenient. Superficial Christians may attend church and claim to love it, but deep down, they are in love with the world and its desires. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-16 through 16 admonishes us not to love the world or anything in it. If we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not from the Father, but from the world. The allurements of this world are real, and it can provide temporary pleasures and distractions that make us forget about eternal matters. As Christians, it is important for us to acknowledge that sin can offer temporary pleasures, but ultimately, it leads to destruction. Now, when speaking about rapture, some people are afraid of it or feel a sense of apprehensiveness regarding the rapture because they are not sure they will be caught up. They are scared that they will fall in the first group of people I have discussed. But I want to encourage you that the rapture is an event you should long for. Don't fear whether you are saved or not. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You can know you are saved because the Spirit bears witness that you are born again. You know you are saved because your life has changed and is changing and is continuing to change. You are becoming less and less like your old self and more and more like a disciple of Jesus. Don't fear the rapture, look forward to it. How can you not look forward to it? How can you not look forward to heaven? Allow me to be just honest for a second. This world is a mess. It's a complete mess. Joy never ever lasts in this world. And this world has a strange way of shocking you. This world is so broken and nothing lasts forever. Even the most wonderful, most glorious marriages of this earth still end with death. Even the most wonderful marriage still ends with one of the two being heartbroken when the other one dies. But when the Lord Jesus comes and claims his church, there will be no more death. Imagine that. 
living a life where there is no death. Look forward to the rapture, because after the rapture, there is no more death. Oh, I have seen families weep. I have seen families weep bitter tears. Pastors see that. Pastors see what others don't usually get to see. Time and time again, I have seen families feel grief, real grief, real pain, real sorrows. When they lose the person, the person that is near and dear to them. I encourage you to look forward to the rapture and the coming of the Lord. Sometimes when I'm riding my motorbike under the shining sun, I think to myself, what if he comes now? That is our hope, our blessed hope. I ride for hours, eagerly anticipating his arrival. At any moment, the Lord Jesus Christ could come and call out our names, and we will leave this world. Look forward to it, my friends, because when he comes, all your sorrows will end forever. Look forward to his coming, for when he comes, you will never have to worry about your health again. Sickness has troubled humanity, affecting people of all ages and fitness levels. But in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, all sickness will be gone. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16-17 through 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus, Jesus himself said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. The angels said, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The rapture doesn't have a specific date. It will happen suddenly and quickly, in just a moment. The archangel's trumpet will announce it. Those who have died as believers in Christ will hear it and rise from their graves with new glorious bodies. They will join the Lord in the sky. Even though they are gone, they are waiting. We who are still here on earth are also waiting for the rapture.